Okay, well, thanks a lot. I'm uh, glad to be back here. So as uh, Clifford said, uh, my title in these lectures is uh, Supersymmetry Phenomenology. And uh, I think in uh, earlier lectures, you've heard quite a bit about the uh, underlying formalism of quantum field theory, supersymmetry, and so on. And uh, what I want to try in these lectures is to uh, build on what you've already learned about supersymmetry and discuss how one can use it to make models that might be relevant to uh, forthcoming experiments. Then I'll discuss in the second lecture uh, some of the key experiments that we're planning at uh, the CERN Accelerator in Geneva, where I work. And then, depending on how we progress with the material, uh, in the last lecture... I would hope to go on to another subject uh, related to cosmology and astronomy. Uh, I think you've all heard about astrophysical dark matter. And uh, one of the interesting possibilities that a lot of us are working on is that uh, this dark matter might actually be composed of supersymmetric particles. And there's quite a close interplay between the sort of ideas about cosmological dark matter and the search for supersymmetry at accelerators, which I'd like to try to bring out uh, in the last part of the lectures. So that, roughly speaking, is, uh, is a program. Now, uh, I mean, you've heard already quite a bit about supersymmetry. Uh, you know that it relates uh, bosonic particles to uh, fermionic particles. Uh, but why is it that one might expect supersymmetry to show up at accelerators in the foreseeable future? And this is the first topic that I want to discuss Now, where did supersymmetry come from? Well, I, I'm uh, not quite old enough to remember what particle physicists were doing back in the 1960s. Uh, back in that time, people realized that there were all sorts of uh, internal symmetries of particles, uh, some of which you know about, like isospin, for example. And people also knew that there were lots of what you might call external symmetries of particles, uh, like spin degrees of freedom, like Lorentz invariance. And uh, a lot of people tried to combine these two together and tried to find some sort of symmetry which would link together uh, the internal properties of particles with these external properties of particles. And uh, you know, just before I be started becoming a graduate student, this was a real big industry, uh, it was no longer an industry when I became a graduate student because it had been proved to be impossible. It had been proved that there was no symmetry which would relate particles' internal properties to spin. Uh, however, just after it had been proved to be impossible, people started realizing how you could actually do it. And... Uh, the early literature on this goes back uh, a little bit over uh, 30 years now. And uh, I mentioned here some of the, the people who did it, uh, some Russian, Russian, Russian mathematicians, Goldfant and Lichtmann. But perhaps the most uh, important breakthrough in this was actually taken in the very early days of string theory. So you've, you've had a lot of lectures on string theory. And uh, when people first wrote down <coughs> string theories, they only had bosons in them. And people said, well, this is not much good. After all, uh, we are made of uh, fermions, right? Uh, and uh, Neveu, Schwartz, and uh, Ramon, back in 1971, uh, tried to figure out how you could introduce uh, fermions into string theory. Uh, you know, nowadays it seems relatively trivial. People do it all the time. But at the time, that time, it was, uh, it was a big deal. However, at that stage, it was still supersymmetry in this rather abstract uh, string world, uh, living basically on the uh, string world sheet where you just have a simple two-dimensional field theory. And the, the first uh, four-dimensional theories came, well, almost exactly 30 years ago now. Uh, the first uh, work on this subject, again, was done in what was still at that time the Soviet Union, and it wasn't particularly useful by Volkov and Akolov. Uh, 
But I would say the, uh, the first really useful uh, supersymmetric uh, theory in four dimensions, uh, well, the first theories were written down by Wesson and Zemino uh, almost exactly uh, 30 years ago. And I uh, scraped through the CERN archives and I found uh, the cover page of uh, one of their first papers on the subject. Uh, they talk about something called super gauge transformations, which nobody talks about anymore. But anyway, if you dig deep enough in this paper, you will find supersymmetry. And in fact, later on in this lecture, I, I will attempt to give at least a sort of resume of the sorts of things that they were doing in that first paper. Okay, so around 30 years ago then, we had for the first time these theories which uh, combined bosons with fermions. And, uh, well, what is this useful for? Well, one of the first thoughts that people had was, uh, okay, one well-known fermion is a neutrino. Uh, the neutrino is massless or very nearly massless. Back in those days, people thought it might actually be strictly massless. And uh, as you may have heard from uh, Alan Martin's lectures, if you have a symmetry, one of the ways of realizing it is to have massless particles. So people said, well, maybe we make supersymmetry by having a massless fermionic particle, the neutrino. And this was very popular for a couple of weeks until uh, people proved that it was impossible, that then the interactions of neutrinos would be even weaker than what we know them to be. So that idea didn't work. Then uh, there was a bunch of uh, people who, starting with Western Zemino, in fact, showed that uh, if you had a theory with fermions and bosons, then when you calculated higher order corrections, then these theories had fewer infinities in them. And in fact, some of these theories didn't have any infinities at all. They were completely finite theories. And this is something which is still of great interest and excitement to more formal uh, theorists even today. And some people thought that this might be somehow useful for making a, a real theory of particles. Wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to worry about renormalization in some sense, at least not infinite renormalization. Well, in fact, as we'll see later on, some aspects of this fact that in a supersymmetric theory you don't have so many infinities is actually important, is actually useful for, uh, for model building, but perhaps not quite in the way that people originally thought. Another thought that people had uh, in particular, uh, Fayet was uh, very energetic in this, was to maybe uh, use supersymmetry to relate the mythical Higgs boson to other particles. So you probably heard from Alan Martin that uh, the Higgs boson is supposed to have zero spin. But of course, all the other particles that we know of in the standard model have either a half integer spin quarks and leptons, or they have integer spin, like the photon, like the W boson. So what Faye said was, well, if we want to somehow connect the Higgs up with everything else, maybe what we need is a supersymmetry which relates particles with different spins. So this he pursued with uh, great energy, again for a, a year or two in the 1970s, but then it became apparent that that wouldn't work either because the internal quantum numbers of the Higgs boson and other particles didn't match. And I'll discuss this in a bit more detail uh, later on in this lecture. Now, let me just mention here a, a couple of other ideas that were circulating about how supersymmetry might be important. In fact, there was a, an important theorem that was proved by uh, Haag, Roposhansky, and Sonius that in some sense the most general type of sy symmetry that you could have in a quantum field theory 
would be supersymmetry. And, uh, okay, as you heard, I come from Switzerland, and in Switzerland, supposedly, there's a fundamental legal principle that uh, anything which is not forbidden is compulsory. So people said, well, you know, if supersymmetry is a possible symmetry, then surely it must be realized somewhere. And in fact, there have been various claims, for example, in atomic physics and even nuclear physics to see some sort of approximate form of supersymmetry. But of course, what I'm going to be talking about in these lectures is fundamental supersymmetry at the most elementary level. So one of the things that was done in the early days, which I guess that you heard about from Jim, was how you could make a theory with local supersymmetry, which involved gravity. And so then people said, rather similar to what Faye had been saying, okay, in gravity we have uh, the graviton, which has spin two. Maybe we could somehow use supersymmetry to change the spin of the graviton and relate it to particles with less spin, such as gauge bosons or even eventually matter particles, or even eventually, if you had sufficiently much supersymmetry, you could relate it to the Higgs boson. So this, again, was a very, an idea which was very popular, I would say, in the early 1980s. Now, what I've given you is a, is a very sort of quick overview of some of the early ideas that were around about what you might do with supersymmetry. But there's absolutely nothing in here which really gave any hint as to what energy scale supersymmetry might appear. And you know, you've heard a lot about string theory. You know that string theory very likely uh, becomes relevant at an energy scale of something like 10 to the 19 GV. And many of the motivations that I've given here would uh, be quite consistent with supersymmetry only appearing at 10 to the 19 GV and not before. Now, if you are, string theorists will tell you that supersymmetry is necessary for the consistency of string theory. But for all you know, it could appear at 10 to the 19 GV, right? There's no reason why it should appear at next week's accelerator. So what I want to discuss next is why indeed it might appear at next week's accelerator. So this has to do with something which uh, in the jargon is called the hierarchy problem. So the hierarchy problem here has nothing to do with your uh, senile old professors who uh, ruled the department. I apologize, Dave. <laughs> it has to do with the uh, tremendous hierarchy of mass scales that we have in physics. So you know about the Planck mass. This is the intrinsic scale associated with gravity. This is the scale where the gravitational force <coughs> grows to have the same strength as the other fundamental forces. So this is about 10 to the 19 GV. So this is many, many, many orders of magnitude larger than the typical scale of elementary particles. Uh, from Alan Martin's lectures, you've heard about the standard model. You've heard about the W particle, the Z particle, which weigh 80, 90 GV. The top quark weighs maybe twice that. But you know, 100 GV, this is 17 orders of magnitude smaller than the Planck mass. Now, you can reformulate this uh, tremendous ratio of mass scales in different ways. And uh, here I give a couple of alternative ways of thinking about this hierarchy problem. Gravity, you know, is very weak. Gravity is controlled by Newton's constant. Newton's constant is just, by definition, 1 over m Planck square. You also know about the Fermi constant. The Fermi constant determines the strength of the, the weak interactions. Those weak interactions are, are quite weak, because they're inversely proportional to the W mass squared. But these weak interactions 
are something like 30 or 35 orders of magnitude stronger than the gravitational interactions. So the reason for that, of course, is that the W boson that carries the weak interactions is much lighter than the Planck mass which characterizes the gravitational interactions. So you see, this is just a rewrite of what I said on line one. Now, an alternative way of motivating the importance of the hierarchy problem is to ask yourself, why is it that when you're doing condensed matter physics or, or chemistry, that you forget about the Newton force, the Newton potential inside an atom? Inside an atom, you only ever worry about the Coulomb potential. The Coulomb potential is given by the electric charge squared. The Newton potential, that would be given by Newton's constant times the masses of the particle in the atom. Let's say the mass of the electron, the mass of the nucleus. Now, because the masses of the particles in the atom are standard model particle masses, so these are very small masses, these are 100 GeV or less, of course, the electron is much lighter than 100 GeV. These masses are infinitesimal compared with a Planck mass, and so the Newton potential is totally negligible compared with the Coulomb potential. So if, if ever you know, one of your condensed matter colleagues or one of your chemist colleagues tells, asks you, well, why do you worry about the hierarchy problem? You can tell them that this is so that you can do uh, chemistry with electrodynamics and you don't have to worry about gravitodynamics, which nobody understands, apart from the string theorists, but nobody understands them. Okay, so this is a problem. How come in the theory in which you have this absolutely enormous fundamental mass scale, how does this small mass scale emerge? How is it possible that you could get a very, very small W mass in a theory where the fundamental scale is extremely large? It's a, it's a little bit like if you had a, a theory of elephants and then all of a sudden this theory of elephants produces a flea. I mean, normally you expect elephants to produce elephants, right? So how did this flea come out of these elephants? Well, you might say, well, what's the big deal? I just make the theory in such a way that the elephants produce a flea. I just fine-tune the parameters of the theory in such a way that I have a very light W mass, uh, don't ask me why, that's just what God or whoever's running this place decided, and we just have a very small W mass and that's it. The trouble with that is, so when you calculate in quantum field theory, when you calculate loop diagrams, so quantum corrections, and here I've written down some typical uh, diagrams, sorts of things that you calculate, you find that these tend to change the mass of the Higgs boson or the, w or the W boson. And the changes in the Higgs or the W mass that they produce, well, they're actually infinite. Um, well, in quantum field theory, one comes across things which are infinite all the time. And one of the ways of dealing with those is to put in a, a cutoff. You say, okay, I calculate with this theory up to some energy scale lambda, and this energy scale lambda represents some scale at which I believe the theory changes in some way. Okay, so we calculate these diagrams in the standard model up to some scale lambda. So we're believing that the standard model works up to some scale lambda. Now, if the standard model worked all the way up to M Planck, then this correction here would be well, maybe a little bit smaller than M Planck, but not much smaller than M Planck. So you get a quote-unquote small quantum correction to the mass of the W boson, which would be 17 orders of magnitude larger. Well, that sounds a bit silly. Of course, you could always fine-tune the theory in such a way 
that the mass of the W boson before you did this calculation was minus 10 to the 19 GV. Then you calculate this small correction of plus 10 to the 19 GV, and you just make a tiny little fine correction so that the final mass, when you add the two together, is not quite cancelled, but leaves you with a net 100 GV. That's certainly possible, but you'd have to be a mathematician or a field theorist to believe that that was reasonable. What you would prefer would be a theory in which you didn't have these enormous quantum corrections, in which this sort of infinity here, which I've hidden by calling it a cut-off lambda, where this sort of infinity was not present. And this is where supersymmetry comes in. Remember, I commented perhaps rather quickly that one of the things that first excited people about supersymmetry was that many of the infinities that you come across in a normal field theory are absent. And this is one of them that, you, that disappears in the presence of supersymmetry. So specifically, if you look at these diagrams here, you notice that I've enabled them with a minus sign and a plus sign. The ones with minus signs, those are the ones where I've got fermions in the quantum corrections. The ones with plus signs, those are the ones with bosons. Okay, so the idea of supersymmetry is that you relate fermions to bosons, right? Now, if you have equal numbers of fermions and of bosons, then you have equal numbers of diagrams. If you also make the couplings, uh, the interactions of the bosons and the fermions the same, then you can get the two classes of diagrams to cancel out completely. <coughs> And so that's what you do in supersymmetry. You have fermions related to bosons. You have equal numbers of fermions and bosons. They have identical couplings. And in that way, this quadratic divergence disappears. Now, we actually know that the bosons and the fermions don't have exactly the same masses. I mean, the W mass is 80 GV. The electron mass is half an MeV. So supersymmetry can't be an exact symmetry. And if you're going to do this cancellation, you're not going to get strictly zero. You're going to get something which is proportional to the difference between the boson and the fermion mass squared. But if the difference between the boson and the fermion mass squared is sufficiently small, then this correction is going to be small. What do I mean by sufficiently small? Well, you go through the numbers this would require that bosons and their fermionic partners should have mass squared which differ by at most 1 TV squared or 1,000 GV all squared. So this here in purple is the reason why we might think that supersymmetric particles might show up at accelerators that are now under construction. None of the arguments that I gave earlier gave you any reason at all to think that either you or your grandchildren would ever see supersymmetry. But this is a reason why you might see supersymmetry in order to cancel out this divergence that you have when you try to calculate the W or the Higgs mass. Um, maybe I should pause at this point and see whether there are any questions about this or comments on it. Yeah? You don't see this What? Yeah. What, what, does what does it imply? Well, uh, if I had a hat, I would eat it. But uh, I lost my hat because I left it on the German train. Uh, I'll discuss in more detail tomorrow what I think is the key signature of supersymmetry at accelerators. Actually, I think the key, the, the key signature will actually be finding the Higgs boson. If, if you don't find a Higgs boson, for example, at the LHC, then I think you know that supersymmetry is wrong. It's conceivable that supersymmetry is right and we will not find it at the accelerators that are now being built. That would be very disappointing, uh, but it wouldn't necessarily completely kill the theory. If, if there's no supersymmetry, 
then I think we would probably have to give up on the idea that uh, the Higgs boson in particular is an elementary particle. And I'll discuss one such idea uh, this afternoon if you come to my public lecture. Uh, I think what you'd have to do is you'd have to say that at some level calculating these diagrams in regular quantum field theory stops making sense and these particles which I'm drawing in these loops here aren't really elementary particles but are actually composite objects. I think that would be the alternative if supersymmetry doesn't show up. That was my question, John. Is the minus sign in the fermion loop and the plus sign in the boson loop, do they hold for all masses? Yeah. The minus sign and the plus sign, those are absolutely fundamental and those are related to the types of statistics that these guys have. Fermi Dirac versus Bose-Einstein statistics. And it's, if you like, going back, it's related to the fact that you have commutation rules for bosons and anti-commutation rules for fermions. So those signs, those are, those are, those are sacred. Right? Yeah. Not many things these days are sacred, but those are sacred. Why just close this door and the screen won't move around so much? Yeah, okay. Okay, so I, I've tried to uh, give you, you know, one way of thinking about this hierarchy problem and how supersymmetry could be useful in solving this hierarchy problem, at least getting rid of some of those horrible infinities. Now, in fact, if you try to produce a, a theory which is more complicated than the standard model, you always encounter difficulties when you try to arrange some hierarchy of mass scales. And what I have on this transparency is in some sense, you know, quote-unquote, additional boxed material, but it's another example of the sorts, other examples of the sorts of problems that you encounter. For example, sometimes people try to make grand unified theories with proton decay, neutrino masses, and so on and so forth. In those theories, typically, there is some new large mass scale introduced so-called gut scale. Again, what happens is that when you try to make the gut scale coexist with a very small W mass scale, you find it doesn't work. Again, you find that even if you tune the theory so that the couplings between the heavy particles and the light particles are absent, when you calculate loop corrections, you find that they reappear again. Now, to get rid of these uh, um, pollution, if you like, this pollution of the light mass scale by the heavy mass scale, again, it turns out that these properties of supersymmetry that you don't have infinities plays an important role. And another difficulty comes when you try to make a quantum theory of gravity uh, Stephen Hawking in particular has written papers arguing that if you try to make a quote-unquote generic quantum theory of gravity without supersymmetry, then you will find that there are quantum gravitational corrections to the mass of, for example, an elementary scalar particle, which are extremely large of order M Planck. Now, in fact, the, the way that Stephen Hawking interprets that is to say, therefore, there's something wrong with the idea of an elementary Higgs boson. So it goes back to what I was saying a moment ago in answer to your question. Stephen Hawking has actually been quoted as saying he doesn't think that we'll ever find a Higgs boson. He thinks that there is no such thing as an elementary Higgs boson for precisely this reason. But what I would say is, okay, there's no problem with having an elementary Higgs boson, providing that you also have supersymmetry to protect it and to remove these very large corrections. Okay, so those are the uh, sort of motivations that uh, I would have for thinking that supersymmetry might show up in the near future. Those are the theoretical motivations. Now, I would say that there are a couple of uh, experimental hints that maybe this is not complete 
uh, scrap. And here I mention them on this transparency. Again, I discussed in answer to your question that one of the key predictions of supersymmetry is that there has to be a Higgs boson. And in fact, this Higgs boson has to be relatively light. I won't go through the details of this calculation. Maybe I'll say a little bit more about it tomorrow. But uh, in the minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model, I apologize, a piece of jargon snuck in without my uh, being aware of it. Anyway, the smallest supersymmetric theory you can make, you can calculate what the mass of the Higgs boson should be, and it's less than about 130 GV. Now, experiments that were done at uh, LEP uh, at CERN over the past decade, they didn't find the Higgs boson, but they gave us quite a hint as to what its mass might be. And the answer is probably less than 200 GV, and the most likely value is indeed less than 130 GV. So this is, well, this is not actually quite data yet, but this is at least a, a plot closely based on data. And uh, this is supposed to be the, the probability distribution for the Higgs boson. Well, it's the chi-square distribution, which is a measure of the probability. So the, the most probable value for the mass of the Higgs boson based on the analysis of data from accelerators will be at the bottom of this curve here. And you see it's around 100 GV. This likely shaded region is the region where we looked uh, directly for the Higgs boson at CERN a few years ago, and we didn't find it. So this left shaded region is excluded. So you see the most likely value for the Higgs boson mass is somewhere around here, okay? in the region which has not been excluded and which is favored by this global analysis of experiments. So the most likely value for the Higgs boson mass looks like it's close to 100 GV, maybe a bit more, and this is completely consistent with what you expect in a supersymmetric theory. So this is one of the reasons why I'm relatively bullish about finding the Higgs boson relatively soon, <coughs> and also, by extension, finding supersymmetry. And in my lecture this evening, I'll discuss in more detail the search for the Higgs boson. Another reason for favoring supersymmetry is uh, this plot, which is by now uh, rather famous. This shows what happens if you try to unify all the different particle, particle interactions into a single grand unified theory. And what you do is uh, you put in the measured strengths of the different interactions in the standard model, and then you try to extrapolate up to high energies. And in this first plot up here, I extrapolate up to high energies without putting in any additional particles. I just keep the standard model and just see what happens if I believe the standard model works all the way up. And what you see is that these interactions never all have the same strengths. They always have different strengths. So this is going to make it impossible to actually unify them into a single theory. In a single theory, you just have one underlying interaction. But this bottom plot shows you what happens if you, again, take the measurements at low energies, but now you assume that there are some additional particles with a mass of the order of 1,000, 10,000 GeV. In fact, supersymmetric particles. And with those supersymmetric particles, the extrapolation to high energies is slightly different. And it's slightly different in such a way that indeed all the interactions do acquire equal strengths at a scale around 10 to the 16 GV. So it's possible in a theory with supersymmetry to believe in unification of all the interactions. That is possible if the supersymmetric particles weigh somewhere around 1,000 GeV. Now, this argument 
can't be used in some sense to invert the argument, to calculate how heavy the supersymmetric particles have to be and to tell us exactly whether we're going to find supersymmetry at the upcoming LHC accelerator. But it's certainly very consistent with that idea. So are there any questions at this stage? In addition to, if you like, the theoretical reasons for supersymmetry, I've also given you a couple of you know, experimental half reasons for liking or expecting supersymmetry to show up relatively soon. Why do supersymmetric particles not only change the slip, but change the sign of the slip for alpha 2? Why does that have such a radical effect on alpha 2, but not on the, the uh, electromagnetic? Okay. I, I don't know. Detailed question. Well, um, I'll try to. Do, have people here heard about asymptotic freedom? Some people, yes. Okay. So, according to asymptotic freedom, as you go up to higher energies, interaction gets weaker and weaker. So, this is certainly true for QCD, even if you put in supersymmetric quarks. Okay. For the uh, SU2 part of the standard model, it's also true. But it's not true, but it's a very delicate business. And in the SU2 part of the standard model, if you add in supersymmetric particles, then it's no longer asymptotically free, but it's asymptotically unfree. And that's what's happening here. Whereas if you take electrodynamics, that is always asymptotically unfree. Yeah. Uh, okay. All that we know about the early, the early universe, the, the earliest thing that we can be sure about in the early universe uh, was when the temperature was about maybe 10 MeV. Before then, we really don't know what was going on. It, according to supersymmetry, supersymmetry would have been relevant when the universe was much hotter than 10 MeV. Uh, now, what I'm going to discuss in my last lecture is if you believe in the standard Big Bang cosmology and you extrapolate back, back to temperatures higher than 10 MeV, then you can calculate how many supersymmetric particles there should be in the universe today. And if you do that, you find that they could give the dark matter if the supersymmetric particles weigh about a TeV, about 1,000 GeV. So that cosmological dark matter argument is yet another reason for thinking the supersymmetry would show up at around a TeV. Okay, but that involves an extrapolation of, strictly speaking, what we know about Big Bang cosmology. It means that we have to extrapolate backwards to much higher temperatures than we currently have experimental evidence for. Okay. So having, I hope, convinced you that supersymmetry should really be there for purely phenomenological reasons, now I'm going to spend a bit of time discussing uh, the features of supersymmetric field theories which are going to be most relevant for the model building that I'm going to be doing later on. So here there may be some overlap with what you've heard about from Jim and so on, but I guess that's not going to be a problem. <coughs> okay. So we're trying to relate bosons to fermions. Uh, clearly this has to be done by symmetries which are not bosonic charges, but they're fermionic charges. So there's implicitly a spinorial index in here so that this supersymmetry charge becomes fermionic. Now, you remember that I was uh, saying you know, that back in the 1960s, before even I became a graduate student, uh, but not before I chose my hairstyle, uh, people showed that you could not combine particles of different spins. But back in those days, what they were doing was they were trying to use 
scalar charges or bosonic charges in general to mix together uh, particles of different spin. And in fact, there's a very simple uh, exercise which maybe you would like to do in your discussion groups, or basically going through the details of this argument that I now give, to prove that you cannot have uh, conserved charges with spin higher than zero. I mean, for example, supposing that you had a, another charge which was, let's say, a tensor charge. So if I take the value of this tensor charge in a particle, let's call it A, then this is going to have to be given by some tensor on the right-hand side and the only tensors that I can use are the momentum of this particle A and the metric tensor. Now, it's easy to check, and this I leave as an exercise, that if you collide two particles, 1 plus 2, and try to get 3 plus 4, then you're going to have to, if you're conserving this charge, you conserve what I call alpha here, you're going to have to conserve this quadratic combination of momenta. Of course, you also have to conserve linear momenta. And if you try to conserve the linear momentum p mu and also the square p mu p nu, you rapidly find that the only sort of scattering that you can have is just forward scattering, where the particles just basically go through each other, or maybe when they bounce backwards. But you can't have scattering through a, a non-trivial angle. So... This sort of theory clearly doesn't describe nature because in nature, cars collide all the time and they often collide off at 90 degrees and this would be forbidden if you had these tensor charges. However, it would not be forbidden if you had spinorial charges because if you have a spinorial charge with a little index sitting down here and you take its value in some single particle state, you're clearly going to get zero. So if you tried to repeat this argument for a spinorial charge, you would never get an equation like that because that would automatically be satisfied by zero equals zero. Okay, so let's imagine then that we have a spinorial charge and uh, of course we want it to be conserved so here I made sure that it uh, commutes with a Hamiltonian and uh, here I've introduced a little upper index which is supposed to count the number of different supersymmetry charges that I have. So this is not the spinorial index. This is maybe I was going to make supersymmetric isospin or something or supersymmetric, some other symmetry so I've got several different supersymmetric charges. Okay, so these charges are supposed to commute with a Hamiltonian so that they are symmetries. But if they commute with a Hamiltonian, then also their anti-commutator must commute with a Hamiltonian. Now I've got this QI anti-commuted with QJ. Now this commutes with a Hamiltonian. It's a symmetry. But if it's a symmetry, then by the argument I had on the previous transparency, this, when I commute it, cannot be a tensor. And in fact, the only possible thing that this could be is proportional to the momentum factor. I can't have a tensor charge over here. I could have a scalar charge, but that's another story. Okay. <coughs> So these uh, distinguished gentlemen here proved, in fact, that the only possible supersymmetry algebra was one in which when I take the anti-commutator of the supersymmetric charges, I get the momentum vector on the right-hand side. And then they show that there's a lot of sort of green theoretical garbage over here to make the whole thing consistent. But basically, for the purpose of this lecture, all we need to catch a hold of is the fact that when you commute, sorry, anti-commute 
two supersymmetric charges, you get the momentum. Now, if I just have uh, one supersymmetric charge, then I change the spin by one half a unit. So I can, for example, relate particles of spin one half to particles of spin zero, particles of spin one to particles of spin one half. Or I could relate particles of spin two to relate to particles of spin three halves. So what I'm going to be doing for the next few minutes is discussing theories in which I just have these very simple supermultiplet building blocks. And a little bit later on, either today or tomorrow, I will discuss why it is that, at least for phenomenology, theories with more supersymmetric charges are not useful. Okay, but the ones that are going to be useful for phenomenology are these simple building blocks here. Now, the next thing I want to convince you of is that you may not have realized it, but you've been doing supersymmetry all your lives. Uh, I don't know whether you know there's a play by Moliere where one of the characters wants to acquire an education, and he suddenly discovers that he's been speaking prose all his life. So I want to convince, convince you that you've been doing supersymmetry all your lives or at least since last week when you learned quantum field theory. Okay, so you've been doing supersymmetry for a week. And the way I convince you of this is I show you that the simplest possible field theory that you could write down without interactions, with one fermion and one boson, that this theory is supersymmetric. So how do we do this? Well... Let's start off with a boson, and we're going to make a, some sort of transformation on this. Now, I want to transfer, because it's supersymmetry, I want to transform the boson into a fermion. So I have some infinitesimal change in the boson field phi, which is proportional to the fermion field psi. Now, what happens when I then try to make, I imagine doing a little sort of rotation in this internal space, like bosons going to fermions and fermions going to bosons. So now when I bring the fermion back to become a boson, there's a bit of a snag because if you look at the dimensions of this thing, a boson field has dimension one, fermion field has dimension three halves, so this little E thing here, which is supposed to be the amount of the supersymmetry transformation, actually has to have non-trivial dimensions minus one half. I'm not sure that everybody's talking about this large. The, the, this slash here? Yeah, yeah sorry, this is, uh, this is when I combine... Um, in this particular case, D, this is just a partial derivative, okay? And uh, when I do this, this is what I call D slash. I apologize. Thank you for, thank you for that. Okay. So now, if I want to make a transformation on the fermion. So this has dimension three halves. My little boson here has dimension one. My infinitesimal transformation has dimension minus a half. So I'm going to need to introduce something else here to get the dimension straight. And the only possible thing to put in here, since I have a very, really simple theory with no masses or anything, is to put in a derivative or momentum operator. So this is the simplest possible transformation law that I could imagine writing down. 
There's another bit over here which I could imagine doing, but let me not get into that complication. Now, if you take this Lagrangian, which I've written up here, and you look at the total change in the Lagrangian, then from the transformation in the first bit, I'm going to get something which is proportional to uh, psi bar phi. From this bit, I'm going to get a piece which is proportional to phi d psi. The whole thing with the derivative sitting outside. Now, this of course means that the Lagrangian changes, right? Because the Lagrangian changes by the derivative. But this is a total derivative. So when I compute the change in the action, so this is the change in the integral over the Lagrangian over the whole of space. It's going to be the integral of a total derivative, <coughs> and so that's going to vanish. So this very simple little theory is supersymmetric. It's in some sense a sort of trivial supersymmetry, but nevertheless, it's, it's a real supersymmetry. And how does a supersymmetry work? Well, this supersymmetry works because I change a boson into a fermion, and then I change a fermion for this simple dimensional reason that I tried to explain, into a derivative of a boson. So boson to fermion to derivative of boson. And you can easily check that the same thing happens here. The fermion changes into a derivative of a, of a boson, which then, of course, changes into a derivative of a fermion. Well, a, a derivative in quantum mechanics or quantum field theory is basically the same thing as a momentum operator. So what I've got here is a transformation law where if I combine two of these transformations, two Qs, then I get the momentum. So this really is supersymmetry. Okay? Bosons going into fermions, fermions going into derivatives of bosons, two supersymmetry charges, same thing as momentum. Is this glaringly apparent to people? Okay, well, that was, that was the easy bit. Now, for uh, extra credit, we will do the problem where we don't just have a, a free boson and a free fermion, but we have bosons and fermions that interact. So what I've done now is, this is the part of the Lagrangian that I had before, which has just the uh, kinetic terms for the bosons and the fermions. But now I've included a uh, potential for the scalar fields, and I've introduced an interaction between the fermions and the bosons, which is sufficiently general to include a mass term. That would be if I didn't have any dependence on the bosons here, but I just had a constant here. That would just give me a mass term. Or if I put in here, for example, a term proportional to a boson field, then I get the sort of so-called Yukawa interaction, which is what gives masses to the quarks and leptons in the standard model. So this thing is sufficiently complicated to in principle, generate masses for fermions and to generate a potential for the scalar particles. Now then what you can do is you can try making the sorts of supersymmetry transformations that I was doing on the previous transparency. Bosons into fermions, fermions into derivatives of bosons. And then you can try constraining the properties of this potential and the interactions to make sure that the supersymmetry algebra is retained. And there's a number of simple exercises of this type that you can do which show you that, in fact, the form of the effective potential is completely determined in terms of the interactions between the bosons and the fermions. <coughs> 
And uh, here I try to go through the details of this argument. I'm not sure whether I'm going to succeed in, uh, in really doing it properly, but anyway, let me try. So here I change the mass term. So for example, this is going to involve a piece where I take one of the bosons in here and I change it into a fermion and I have this derivative of the mass term with respect to the, to the bosonic field. But this particular one that I've done here, this is where I imagined that I had a phi star appearing in here. So it's a conjugate of the boson field. But then here I get the conjugate of the fermion field. And it's easy to check that there's no other term in the Lagrangian which could possibly cancel this one out. So that means that this interaction here cannot depend on phi and phi star. It can only depend on phi. Okay, so that's the first simplification. Now, of course, there's also a term in this variation which comes from taking the dependence of the mass for the interaction term on phi with three fermions. But again, there's no way of cancelling this out. There's no other way I can get a three fermion term in this Lagrangian. So this also has to vanish. Now, the way that this vanishes is somewhat sneaky. It vanishes because here I've got three fermions. The product of those three fermions has to be anti-symmetric. So if I can make sure that this term over here is completely symmetric, then symmetry times anti-symmetry gives me zero. And this I can do if this interaction or this mass term here is in fact a symmetric quantity given by the derivative with respect to phi i and phi j of some underlying uh, superpotential. I don't know whether Jim discussed this in his lectures. <coughs> Sorry? I'm not sure. Yeah. It would be difficult to discuss supersymmetry without discussing the superpotential, but maybe it's possible. Okay. So when one is constructing a supersymmetric theory, one of the basic quantities here is a superpotential. And this then determines for you the form of this effective mass or interaction term. Now it also determines for you the form of your scalar potential. And this you can show by an analogous uh, little exercise. Uh, there is uh, another term in the variation of this mass term which now comes about when I vary one of these fermions over here. And you can check that this can be cancelled out if and only if... Well, I have to go through two lines to get there. If and only if the superpotential also determines for you the form of the effective scalar potential. So this is what I go through here. Uh, what you find is that the effective potential must be given by the absolute square of the derivative of the superpotential with respect to the scalar fields phi. Now this is one of the basic reasons why in a supersymmetric theory you can calculate the mass of the Higgs boson. You can calculate the mass of the Higgs boson because the mass of the Higgs boson is related to its, the effective potential of the theory and the effective potential of the theory is completely determined in terms of the other properties, the interactions of the theory. So now what I've written out in uh, the bottom part of this transparency is the general form of this 
interacting supersymmetric theory of bosons and fermions. So here are the kinetic terms. I showed that these were trivially, in some sense, supersymmetric. This is the form of potential and fermion boson interactions, which is determined by supersymmetry, all related to the superpotential W. And here I've written out the forms of the supersymmetry transformations, which you can check, and maybe this is another exercise for the student, to verify that the Lagrangian is not invariant, but the Lagrangian only changes by a total derivative, and hence the action of the theory is invariant. And if you don't like working it out with a very general example of a totally general superpotential W, then try it for this very simple one. Uh, this is the sort of superpotential that actually we meet in, for example, supersymmetric generalizations of the standard model, one which only has uh, a cubic and a quadratic term. And uh, then if you <coughs> go through this standard exercise, this is the effective Lagrangian that you get. And you notice that, for example, uh, the masses of the bosons and the fermions are equal. And there is this Yukawa-like interaction, the sort of thing that would give masses to quarks and leptons. And this is directly related to the quartic term in this effective potential here. So this is the simplest possible example of a supersymmetric field theory. And you know, for much of the phenomenology that I'm going to be doing, this is almost enough. I say almost enough, but of course it's not quite enough because what I've just shown you is a theory of spin zero particles interacting with spin one half particles. But you're also going to need to have the interactions of gauge bosons with their supersymmetric partners. So if I got a gauge boson, this is something which is described by a vector field, and it has a little index here which tells you that it transforms according to the adjoint representation of the gauge group. So it would be, for example, a triplet of SU2 or an octet of SU3. Now, supposing I just introduce some fermions of spin one half with the same internal properties. So these are also a triplet of SU2 or maybe a, an octet of SU3. Now, basically, there is a unique interaction Lagrangian. If I don't have any scalar particles in the theory, there's a unique interaction Lagrangian for this thing, which is the Maxwell Lagrangian and a kinetic term for this uh, uh, fermion, where the slash, or well, that's the slash which I have over here, and the capital D here means that uh, it's a covariant derivative. So I define this just down here. So again, one of the supersymmetric miracles is that if you write down this thing, which you, you, you just, you just basically no freedom, it's just a vector field and the corresponding fermion in the same adjoint representation. This is supersymmetric. And to prove this, you go through the same sorts of mesmerizing algebra that I did before, but basically, it's, it's fairly trivial. Okay, so now you know almost all there is to know about making uh, supersymmetric theory. So let me just remind you of what we've discussed. So we've got these uh, basic uh, these building blocks, which are the chiral multiplet of spin one half and spin zero. So that's the psi and the phi. And then we have the vector multiplet 
which on the previous transport panacea I called A and chi, and so now in order to confuse people, I call it V and V twiddle. These are all that you need in order to make a supersymmetric generalization of the standard model. So you now have to invent some superpotential, which in the simplest case would just be a cubic product of these uh, chiral fields here. And then this gives you both the form of the Yukawa interactions, which is always given by two fermions with one boson, or it gives you an effective potential term, which would be a quartic term involving four, fermion, four boson fields. Then, if I have a gauge interaction, so this is an interaction between uh, some sort of chiral field, its conjugate, and the uh, vector field, then of course I get a normal gauge interaction. Then I have another interaction which is between a fermion, a boson, and the supersymmetric partner of the gauge boson, which I haven't discussed in detail, but it's relatively easy to find. And this is with the same coupling strength as you have for the gauge bosons, with a factor of root two, but this is just trivial. And then there's another contribution to the effective scalar potential. Okay. So, if you get all this into your notes, then this is what you need to know in order to make the sort of supersymmetric uh, model building that I'm going to be discussing in my, le in my lectures. Are there some comments or questions on this? Yeah. Uh, Cow field is just basically jargon. Uh, what I mean by it is it is a, uh, a fermion with a particular helicity, okay, typically left-handed helicity. When I, <coughs> sometimes on my transparencies, I wrote chi subscript L, sorry, psi subscript L, to indicate that I was working with left-handed fermion fields. But I didn't want to get into too much complication. But generally in supersymmetry, when people talk about chiral multiplets or chiral supermultiplets, what they mean is a combination of a spin one half particle and a spin zero particle. Other comments or questions? What you should strictly speaking, what somebody like Jim Gates would do, okay, would be he would sick the boson and the fermion together uh, into some sort of thing which he would call a superfield, and then this superpotential would be a, a function of the superfield. But for my purposes, I'm very simple-minded. I just think of this as being a function of the scalar member of the superfield. And then sometimes when I take the derivative, then I take out a boson field and I replace it by the fermion. Right? So for example, uh, yeah, in, cal in calculating the Yukawa interactions, okay, you take the derivative of uh, this thing with respect to a boson field and you stick out a fermion instead. But... Uh, unless you're really into uh, you know, super space and super fields and so on and so forth, let's just think of it in terms of being a function of the bosons. What about high space? I think you were too uh, out of space. Can you get it out of that? Well, are you asking more what are you saying? Um, that's a little bit more complicated. Uh, if people like to see spin two and spin three halves, I can do that on one transparency too. <laughs> uh, 
Maybe, maybe, I'd, maybe I just do that. Okay. Well, I guess there's a little bit more than one transparency. But okay, anyway. So how do you do uh, spin two and spin three halves? Well, everything that I've done now has been where when I make my supersymmetry transformation, I do it as a global transformation, what you might call a totalitarian symmetry, where everybody has to become supersymmetric at the same rate everywhere at the same time. Now, what happens if you make the supersymmetry transformation, what I would call a democratic transformation, where everywhere in space and time, you're free to make your own supersymmetry transformation by whichever amount of supersymmetry you wish. So the supersymmetry transformation now becomes a local, a local transformation depending on X. And this, I remind you, is what happens in uh, gauge theories. In gauge theories, you make a, a local transformation. Now, It turns out that you can do this only if you introduce uh, gravity, and specifically if you introduce the graviton and its supersymmetric partner, the gravitino. And these are related together in a, another supermultiplet, which is the spin two graviton linked to the spin three halves gravitino. So how does this work? Sorry, this is in response to a question. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm tr trying to make my supersymmetry transformation, which I had earlier on, uh, a local democratic transformation. Uh, so these are the transformations on the bosons and the fermions that I had a short while ago. And what you can see from this is that if I make two such transformations, I transform a field by an amount proportional to its derivative. But now imagine what happens if I make this here depend on where I am in space and time. So what I'm now going to be doing is I'm going to make a transformation on the field, which is a local transformation, a local coordinate transformation. So it stands to reason that if I'm going to make a theory which is invariant on the local coordinate transformations, then it's necessarily going to involve gravity. Now, specifically, if I just take, for example, the uh, simplest theory with a free fermion and a free boson, and if I make the same sort of transformations that I was making earlier on, in addition to the other pieces in the variation that I had before, I'm going to have a piece which is proportional to the derivative of the supersymmetry transformation. If it's like the, the amount of uh, local variation in this supersymmetry transformation. And I promise you that there's no way in which you can cancel this out with anything else in the supersymmetry transformations that I've been making. So I'm going to have to introduce some new feature into the theory to cancel off this local variation. And the previous argument was just to say that this extra thing I'm going to have to do, introduce is probably gravity. Okay, so this is the one transparency on supergravity theory. Okay, so... Let me consider here the kinetic term for a fermion field. So it's got a derivative in it. And what happens if I make a gauge transformation on such a term? Well, then I'm making a phase transformation which depends locally on where I am in space and time. That means that in the variation, there's going to be something which comes from this derivative acting on this local uh, object, 
So I'm going to get something proportional to d mu epsilon. The way I cancel that out in a gauge theory is by introducing a vector field, a mu, which has a variation, which is d mu epsilon, with the opposite sign so as to cancel it out. Supersymmetry. I have a local supersymmetry transformation, E of x. I'm going to get from there a term which is proportional to the derivative of E. The way I cancel it out is to introduce an interaction with a gauge particle, in this case a gauge fermion, psi mu. And by gauge, I mean that it transforms proportional to d mu E with the opposite sign so as to cancel this out. So the construction is very much like it is in a gauge theory. And this spin three halves particle is uh, what I can call a gauge fermion. Now the third supersymmetric miracle of the morning. The first supersymmetric miracle was that if I have a, f a free fermion theory and a free boson theory, that theory is supersymmetric. The second miracle was that if I have gauge bosons coupled to fermions in an adjoint representation, that was also for free supersymmetric. The third miracle of the morning is that if I couple uh, an Einstein graviton action to the simplest possible spin three halves free with no interactions with other particles, and I just make sure that the derivative that appears here is the appropriate covariant derivative, then this theory is automatically invariant under local supersymmetry transformations. This is automatically a supergravity theory. Now, this, of course, is not so trivial, so I'm not going to set this as, a, as an exercise for the student. Uh, you know, it took distinguished people you know, quite a lot of time to prove that this theory was invariant under supersymmetry, and they got the Dirac medal uh, at the ICTP a few years ago to prove that they'd actually done some work. But, but this theory, where I just have a spin two particle interacting with a spin three halves particle, according to the basic you know, rules of local coordinate transformations, this theory is uh, a supergravity theory. So this, this is, I'm sorry, a somewhat long-winded answer to your question. Okay. But this, this is the way that it actually works, and the rest with some sort of preamble to sort of explain it. Okay. Perhaps uh, if I could have five more minutes and I could maybe get to the answer to that question. Sure. I, 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 this is the way you sort of come in, I was sort of, uh, <laughs> you scared me. <laughs> you know, the Clifford is just such a sort of threatening sort of guy, right? <laughs> okay, I, I just wanted in the, in the final five minutes to discuss model building, and then I will try when I'm doing this to answer your question. Okay, so I spent a long time telling you about why you might like supersymmetry and why you would, might like to relate bosons to fermions. So I can just hear you all saying, where's the coffee? No, I can hear you all, <laughs> I can hear you all saying, well, look, in the standard model, we've got a whole bunch of fermions. We've got all those quarks and leptons. We've got a whole bunch of bosons, the photon, the W, the Z, gluons, maybe a Higgs boson. Can we, and I've just been saying that you know, some theory is automatically supersymmetric. Is it possible the standard model is automatically supersymmetric? Could I just relate the fermions of the standard model to the bosons of the standard model? And then we've all been doing supersymmetry all our lives, and the whole thing is trivial. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. And this was what was realized by Fayet when he tried it. Because the internal quantum numbers of these guys over here and these guys over here are different. For example, the quarks are triplets of color. And these guys over here are either singlets or octets of color. The leptons, well, they have lepton number, but there's nothing over here that has lepton number. So the internal 
properties mismatch between the matter particles and the bosons. And there's no way that I can solve this, uh, solve this by introducing supersymmetry. The sort of supersymmetry that I've introduced, it, the gauge interactions over here and over here would have to be the same. And there's nothing over here which, for example, has the same color gauge interactions as the quark over here. So the only possible thing to do is to introduce new Spartners for uh, all the known particles. So for the quark, I have to introduce a squark with spin zero. For the lepton, I have to introduce a slepton with spin zero. So these are the, the chiral supermultiplets of the standard model. Okay? Quarks and squarks, leptons and sleptons. Then I have to introduce spin one-half partners for the vector particles. So photon, photino, z, zeno, w, yno. And for the Higgs, I have to invent a Higgsino. Now, as I hope to discuss in my last lecture, in fact, there's some combination of these three here which would be the likely candidate for the dark matter in the universe. Now, uh, somebody once said to Abdul Salam, well, isn't this very complicated? How could you think that supersymmetry is a fundamental theory of nature? And he said, well, it may not have an economy of particles, but it ha certainly has an economy of principle. You know, one principle, and you get all these wonderful new particles. Yeah, almost. <laughs> we haven't found the Higgs boson yet, but okay. Okay, so now I I've told you what's in the minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model. And uh, what does it contain? Well, it contains a supersymmetric Lagrangian. The supersymmetric Lagrangian uh, you are completely familiar with. You now you guys are ready now to write down any supersymmetric Lagrangian. All you have to do is to write down the appropriate superpotential, right? Right, superpotential, yes. And you know that's given by the Yukawa interactions in the theory. So, for example, the standard model, you know there's a Yukawa interaction which gives masses to the down quarks, one that gives mass to the leptons, one that gives mass to the top quark and up quark and so on. So, basically, you know how to write out the, uh, the superpotential. One small complication, which maybe I'll come back tomorrow, is that even the middle, minimal supersymmetric model, you have to have two Higgs multiplets. We call them H and H bar, and then there's a coupling between the two of them, which I call mu, and that I'll come back to maybe tomorrow. Uh, th this you have to have for two reasons. One is in order to cancel out anomalies, and the other reason is that then I can give masses to particles just using Higgs fields and never using their complex conjugates. Okay, so this, ladies and gentlemen, is the minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model. Unitarity in what sense? What, why should this be a problem with... I mean, in the standard model, you solve that by having just one Higgs multiplet. Why is it that in supersymmetry you would need <coughs> two? No, but I was wondering whether now the Higgs are doublet and now they are also they have an interaction, whether one has to redo the unitarity calculation or whether it's the same. Well, in the standard model, of course, they have to be doublets. And in fact, you can prove basically prove that just by considering simple unitarity arguments. So nothing changes the supersymmetry extension? Well, there may be some argument linked to, the, linked to the fact that the only sorts of interactions are analytic in the superfields. So I jargon. But I, the only way I can shut him up is by using <laughs> jargon. By the fact that the, the superpotential is analytic in the superfields, and that's linked to the form of the interactions. So it may well be true that you can sort of forget about the superpotential and you just use the interactions, and you will find you'll need two Higgses. Okay, so this is the minimal supersymmetric Lagrangian. Excuse me just a second. I'm just going to 
answer her question, and then I'll come to yours. Okay. So, uh, if I wanted to relate the graviton to everything else, since the graviton has spin two, and since the gravitino has spin three halves, if I wanted to relate it, for example, to some uh, vector particle with spin, with spin one, I would need to have two supersymmetry charges. And, well, maybe there are you know, more supersymmetry charges out there somewhere, but it's difficult to see how you could do phenomenology with them because they would forbid parity violation. So, for example, supposing I started off with a particle with helicity plus one half and I made a supersymmetry transformation and changed it to helicity zero, made another supersymmetry transformation to make it supersymmetry, sorry, helicity minus one half. This would be what would happen in an N equals two theory with two supersymmetry charges. Well, then the particle of helicity plus one half and the particle of helicity minus one half would have the same uh, internal properties. In particular, it would have the same gauge interactions. And this, we know, does not happen in the standard model. In the standard model, left-handed particles and right-handed particles have different weak interactions. And this is related to the fact that parity is violated to weak interactions, as was discovered by Mrs. Wu in 1957, and I don't know if you ever met Mrs. Wu, but if you ever turned around and told her that her experiment on parity violation was wrong, you'd be in deep trouble because she was an extremely fearsome lady. Anyway, so parity is violated, says Mrs. Wu, and that means that you cannot have two supersymmetry charges because then you couldn't have parity violation. Sorry, did that answer your question sufficiently? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in order for them to be dark, they would have to not shine, which means they cannot have uh, electromagnetic interactions. So they have to have no electric charge. Presumably also they have no strong interactions because then they would interact with ordinary matter in a different way, which we could also detect. So you have to have something which is uh, electromagnetically neutral and no strong interactions, only uh, weak interactions. So then what you do is you, you look through the list of supersymmetric particles to find out which ones of them uh, have those properties. And those are the candidates, the partner of the photon, the partner of the Z boson, and the partner of the neutral, partners of the neutral Higgs. This maybe I'll discuss in more detail in my third lecture. I guess an additional constraint is that they don't clump and form black holes, which would then produce lensing, which we'd be able to see. Right. So that imposes some sort of constraint on the self-interaction. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Contributions of any other sort? I think everybody needs their tea or coffee. Okay. So uh, let's stop here.